So um, I was wondering whether some of you could tell us maybe some anecdote of why you decided to enter in the field of TDA. What sort of capture, what magic moment was happened in your life that told you, yeah, TDA is really the field in which I would like to, to work? Sure. Um, <laughs> well, the technique of Talkins delay coordinate embedding is pretty much magic to me. It's something that I still think about a lot. And the ability to reconstruct shape from a single measurement function is really beautiful. So I think that was really what inspired me to look at topology as maybe a robust signal about systems. So that's what got me in. Maybe not that embarrassing, but <laughs> still exciting. Uh, so I actually got started from uh, Gunnar Carlson's paper, Topology and Data, uh, but I, I work in a small research institute. Uh, it, it's very small. I'm a mathematician, not entirely a topologist, but I know enough to be dangerous, but I also work with paper <laughs> theorists and uh, you know, high-performance computing engineers. Um, and so I, I read through the, the paper and I was like, I get some of this, but uh, I really don't understand any of this data analytics. But fortunately, I had a colleague who I talked to all the time, and I said, here, can you, can you look at this? Because all he does is data analytics. So he read through it and he said, the data analytics is straightforward, but this topology stuff I don't get. <laughs> um, which, so fortunately, uh, we then just started talking a lot more and uh, realized this is, a, this is a sweet spot for us, because between the two of us, we can actually cover this subject. <laughs> Uh, my story in topological data analysis started uh, more than 10 years ago in summer 2009 when I attended a summer school where um, Gunnar Carlson gave uh, a week-long course and that's uh, where I learned for the first time about TDA. At the same time I have started to read papers by Fred, so it was in 2009, <laughs> yes, so you already had papers in, in this field. and. Uh, there was no single magic moment, it was over two or three years while uh, I was still a pure mathematician working with graphs and topology. So I was learning gradually and uh, from about 2013-14 I started to publish papers and applied conferences. So for me it was a gradual process and I encourage uh, younger people to attend uh, informal workshops on summer schools where you could learn from, from experts. Um. For me, this has been the result of a, a sort of continuous process. <laughs> I, I started as a pure mathematician, and uh, I was a geometer working in geometry. And um, I met some people in computational geometry. It was uh, oh, it's the beginning of the century. And uh, they were, at that time, very interested in uh, surface reconstruction or shape reconstruction problems. So they were doing, in some sense, TDA, but in a very specific context where they were having points sampled on shapes, physical objects, and they were interested in uh, reconstructing representation of these objects that were uh, topologically and uh, geometrically faithful. So I started to think about the question of how and can we and how can we uh, infer some topological and geometric information from shapes or objects continuous objects that are just known through finite uh, samples. And this has been the beginning of uh, my thought about... Uh, and then uh, persistence arrived, at least with the name of persistence, and I started to think about all these things. Yeah, so, so for me it all started when I was an undergrad. Um, I read this magnificent book on topology by, by Anatoly Fomenko, uh, and he's a... It's, it's a superb book. Um, he drew all the things himself. So he has like a spectral sequence and he just draws this magnificent uh, black and white pencil drawing that is like super out of this world and it's super trippy. And I looked at this and I, and I, felt in, uh, I fell in love with topology. So I, I pursued that further uh, until, I, until I did my master's there. And then um, to teach myself a little bit more programming and what topology is all about, I started implementing this on my own, this homology stuff, but, but only normal homology, not persistence. And then at some point, while I was solving some tricky problem, I, I stumbled over a preprint by Edelsbrunner and Zomorodian. Uh, and, I, and I figured out that, this, that people have been doing this for, for real-world data. And then, this was, th then I was hooked. And I actually um, uh, tried to pursue this further in, in my PhD. I approached my advisor and was like, okay, we need to do this. This is like multivariate data analysis for the, for the future. And then, yeah, and then, then I worked a lot. I, I stumbled over a lot of papers from the people here. So um, 
So Fred's papers, for example, persistence-based uh, clustering in Riemannian manifolds, that was that got me started in 2012, I think, and uh, yeah, the rest is history. <laughs> So nobody has said anything embarrassing so far, so I guess it's my turn. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> so I can, I, I can tell an embarrassing story. So I first heard about the, the beginnings of topological data analysis at one of the first meetings that was called Algebraic, Topolog Algebraic Topological Methods in Computer Science. In 2001, there was a meeting at Stanford. And Gunnar Carlson talked about this new notion of persistent homology. And he was applying it to some baby data sets, like being able to tell the difference between point samples from a, the surface of a bottle and point samples from the surface of a sphere, something like this. And I thought, whoop de doo and I, was just like, I thought, it's cool, but no, no what's, what's so exciting about this? And this is what's embarrassing, because I didn't see the potential that, uh, that Gunnar definitely saw. So what made the difference for me was Gunnar's paper with Monica Levine and others uh, uh, sorry, Monica, whatever name, and Ron Levine, about uh, classifying breast cancer, types of breast cancer, looking at genomic data, looking at gene expression data, and showing that by applying these methods, you could actually detect a subtype of breast cancer that nobody detected before, and that actually turned out to be highly resistant to recurrence. And this, to me, was like, oh, oh, all of a sudden, this is actually important. At the time, I was writing... Uh, like bi-monthly column in one of the local newspapers here trying to sell mathematics to the general public. And I thought, this is going to be a great way to sell mathematics to the general public. So I wrote an, an article about this. And the day after it appeared, I was contacted by a local oncologist who said, I need to know more about this. So, I mean, that was where I realized, okay, this is a sort of mathematics that has real world impact. And I wanted to learn more about it. So thank you all for your answer. I think now we are more warmed up. We can tackle really tough question that the audience actually uh, provided on our beautiful platform. So um, let's start with this one. So many of you talked about point clouds, many of you talked about maybe graphs, but at some point we need to, in order to get filtration somehow, uh, a metric space, and these points must be embedded there. So how much does the coordinate system and the metric influence topological data analysis? And if so, how, how do we, can we choose the, the best one somehow? Well, yes. sure. <laughs> um, yeah, I guess I'll just like a real world example, like in doing research with people, before you even put a paper out, you often try a bunch of metrics and something that you're looking for um, is stability under kind of small variations in these metrics. Are you using an L2 metric, an L1 metric? Do you get the same results? So this is something that we often play with and we'll just like throw a bunch of things at a wall and that's just what I'm seeing in practice. So I guess that's just where I'll leave that. But I'm excited to hear about uh, So, so uh, for me, um, I, I uh, added a whole lot of metrics to, to UMAP, which uses these topological techniques and, and uh, goodness, uh, if you uh, swap out different ones, you get entirely different results. So uh, absolutely the metric is critical and the really, really difficult part is that for a lot of cases, it's not at all obvious what metric should be. Um, and uh, I've worked uh, hard with some of my colleagues, and John Healy and Colin Weir have put in a lot of good work on at least for certain data types coming up with purely canonical metrics. So, for example, the word vectors I was talking about, uh, there's a canonical metric there because we're working with multinomial distributions and we know what the metric should be. We know exactly what space it's living in. But if you just have generic data, then it gets very, very hard. So uh, I think that is actually a big challenge for a topological data analysis is understanding what the metric should be for different data sets. Yes, I agree. According to my past experience, uh, the collaboration with the main experts is very important, so we, we need to take this metrics from them, not to try to invent one myself, ourselves. I also agree. I think TDA does not escape this uh, fundamental problem in uh, data science of having a metric, getting a metric. Maybe one uh, good point about TDA is that um, it's less sensitive to coordinates. So once you have the metric, in general, you don't really care about the coordinates, mm -hmm. except maybe sometimes for interpretability questions when coordinates mean something, but otherwise most of the construction are coordinate independent, which is in some cases a very good and important point. And I think that 
There is also something else that you have with TDA is that when you build this growing ball, growing ball is not the, you don't have a single way to grow structures on top of your data. And you have some flexibility on this choice. So this is a benefit, but this is also a drawback because you also have to not only to choose the metric, but also the way you uh, build your structure on top of the data. And they are correlated, they are not independent. So I think up to now, uh, people have had to, to tweak this. Either they were knowing a little, uh, quite well the kind of data they had, and they had some good uh, ideas on how they should do that. But when you don't have any uh, a priori on your data, it's much more difficult. I think now there are some kind of, uh, we, we start to have some tools, mathematical and algorithmic tools, to start to try to learn, help people to learn this, the right construction, the right metric. But uh, my feeling is that we are just at the beginning of the story for these kind of things. I, I agree. I mean, I would like to throw the question back also to the machine learning community because uh, if you write a machine learning paper, then there is all sorts of hidden assumptions on the metric and on the loss function there as well. And so coming up now with, with the goal of going into a machine learning conference with the TDA paper and you raise the question of the metric, then reviewers are maybe just looking at it and being like, okay, what is going on here? Um, nevertheless, um, I do think that with the Euclidean distance, you can go quite far. And there's recent work by Don Sheehy, who looked at uh, the um, persistence, uh, uh, persistence diagrams under uh, um, projections of, the, of your space. And so he was able at least to show that if you have Euclidean uh, distance, that you can uh, preserve the distance function quite well. So, so you, could, you could go about it like, like this. You could say that this sort of um, analysis sort of justifies why, why one should use the Euclidean distance in the first place. But... Um, I think that, that for a lot of domain-specific applications, um, you, need to, you need to talk to people. You need to figure out what they, what they want to use. Maybe they have a metric that they use all the time for their classifiers, and then, then it can actually be an advantage. But yeah, in general, there's no, there's no easy answer, I would say. Yeah, all I can add is that uh, when you work doing real-world applications, that it's extremely important for the, the topologist doing the TDA to be in regular contact with the domain experts. So they'll tell, be able to tell you whether the kind of metric that you're considering makes any sense at all from their point of view. Okay. Yeah. Can I add one more thing? Oftentimes, we don't actually need what properly is a metric. We're yeah. just yeah. into similarity, and I think that's a huge thing to recognize, yeah. that when we talk about growing balls or creating these edges, we could work with just pairwise information and build complexes from that. So sure. that's really powerful in the field. Very nice. Now, the next question has also been asked by the audience, and feel free to say skip if you don't want <laughs> to answer. Okay. So, it's about benchmarking. So, first is whether it makes sense to benchmark topological data analysis or to computational topology algorithms against more machine learning or deep learning algorithms, and if so, how? what's the status? Um, I guess, briefly, yes, I think benchmarking is important, especially when you're Combining TDA with the machine learning algorithm, you have like a natural benchmark to compare it to, like without and with. Um, I'll leave it at that. Uh, I think I think sometimes these comparisons can be uh, uh, difficult because uh, a lot of work has gone into uh, deep learning, specifically for, surprisingly enough, the metrics that they work with, and so it can be very hard to. Um, to, to have a technique that's that's new and hasn't had sort of the equivalent amount of, sort of optimization at this particular goal uh, to, to look as good. So I suspect one has to be a little bit careful because uh, it's what do you want out at the end of the day because I think a lot of these topological techniques are bringing to bear uh, sort of a more rigorous structured math behind what's going on and if that's the sort of thing you're interested in then, then maybe it's okay. Uh, I mean, there are reasons why one might want to use, for example, principal component analysis, which is, let's be honest, a pretty uh, old school uh, dimension reduction technique, but it gives you a lot of strong interpretability about what's going on, and it's got a lot of very easy math behind it to say how it's working, as opposed to uh, much fancier techniques with, say, deep learning or autoencoders. So, you know, I think, I think there's, there's, there's a, a balance to be played. Yes, in applied computer science, benchmarking is very important. However, in other uh, application domains, for example, in crystal structure prediction, benchmarks um, may not be used uh, at all uh, because people um, work uh, maybe a bit more competitively and uh, do not, well, 
public do not talk about the results before publication appears online. Uh, so this is one of the reasons uh, since benchmark benchmarks are, are not available, uh, I have started to uh, solve this problem of crystal structure prediction more from a theoretical point of view to establish uh, theoretical guarantees that can be used uh, for sure. So uh, I think yes, benchmarks are important, and probably we are at a time where the community, TDA community, should think about having some. Benchmark, benchmarks. I think there are two kinds of benchmarks because part of the TDA is also, um, or part of the difficulty of TDA, is also hidden in the computational cost of the procedures that we have to use to compute topological invariant. So I think having benchmarks to test the codes that compute persistence, etc., would be very important and not so difficult because this is some kind of benchmark you use just to compare some algorithms that produce the same outputs. But we also need some, maybe some benchmarks for data science problems, some kind of uh, like there exist in machine learning and also to compare. But with this one, we have to be a little bit more careful, but this is not specific to TDA. Because one thing is that if people start to focus too much on some benchmarks that becomes classical, it's going to happen the same thing as happens with MNIST or something like that. You start to learn about the data, not about science or improving methods. And the other thing is that I think that in general when you try to solve a data science problem, uh, uh, there is not a single way to reach your goal. So it's not because you, you're, uh, so in general what happens is that sometimes when you produce a new result, in particular in TDA where you have some people who are skeptical about TDA, or who are still skeptical, they tell you, oh, if I had used these other methods combined with this one and this one and this one, I could have get the same result. I think that this is probably true. And in any cases, you can always do the same in a different way. So uh, we cannot, we, it's interesting to have benchmarks, but we also need to have some discussion about uh, the result. Because sometimes uh, using topological approaches, you get some kind of interpretability of your result that you don't and get with some, uh, I'd say, if you use a, a huge uh, deep neural network, and it may produce some better results, but you may not understand um, why, why you get the result. And, for example, getting some uh, idea of why you get your result is very important in some fields like health. When you predict something for people, sick people, they really need some explanation, not something like, look at this huge network, and <laughs> you that you're going to die in two days. <laughs> so... Yeah, so, so what I would like to add is that um, we also need good baselines all the time. I mean, and that is true for any machine learning paper or any, any paper in general, but I mean, my perspective is now primarily about machine learning, so this is what I, what I know best. And of course, if you, have, if you write a method like the PWL method, the persistent vice versa Lehman method, uh, which is a hybrid method, and so it has topological components and non-topological components, what you, actually, uh, what you absolutely need to do is you need to do an ablation study. You need to take out the topological features and you need to train a baseline a baseline that is as hard or as strict as possible to, to show the benefits of your, of your features. And that is a general statement that applies regardless of TDA or not TDA. I mean, even specifically for deep learning, you, you, people should be doing this as well. When they throw, let's say, a few attention thing, a uh, few attention layers, a few um, training regimens like weight decay or whatever. So if you want to be really clear, really pure about this, you would have to do all kinds of subsets of those ablations and you would have to see, okay, does it come, does my uh, performance increase come from TDA? Does it come from a combination? Does it come from maybe the pre-processing, whatever? So in, in this sense, this is, this is super important. I'm not sure whether we need additional benchmark data sets that are specific to TDA. I mean, I mean, I would love to see them, don't get me wrong. So like to compare different TDA applications, but if we want to, to have strong applications, then I think it's also good just to think about baselines and about where where we can have an impact in terms of the, the methods that are already there. Because as Fred already said, um, deep networks have a lot of parameters, for example. So this is something where we could say, huh, we're a little bit more agnostic with respect to that. So if you're happy with getting a kind of so-so answer in um, less the time and you don't need, like, let's say, half of Switzerland's nuclear power mm -hmm. to, to train your network, um, then, then you're also happy with that. So, so there, are all, there are all kinds of discussions that can be had in, in a good paper, in a good application paper, or in a good machine learning paper. And people are having those discussions. Um, 
interestingly concerning MNIST, we, we use that a lot for our, for our explainability uh, topology um, uh, paper. And uh, you can read the reviews on open reviews. I, I don't think I'm making this up, but uh, the quote was, you shouldn't use MNIST because MNIST is weird. That is, that is what one of the reviewers said. So, uh, so, so meaning that, that if, if too many people or too many models have been trained for one, of the, for one of the data sets, then of course people start making up those excuses and saying, okay, well, we need, we need others now. And um, I think that always, if you, if you only use benchmarks, then you run the risk of, of losing the big goal. And the big goal is of uh, solving application problems, helping other domains, making scientific discoveries. And you don't make discoveries by pushing the benchmark like 0.5% higher. That's nice to know. But you make a discovery by saying, okay, given all these parameters, given all these constraints, our method actually solves a problem or is interpretable. So it's uh, kind of the big picture here. <laughs> I agree very, very much with Bastian. And uh, certainly when... So the, I have not personally sort of developed new theory related to CDA, but it's really been very application oriented. And in different domain, in different domains, there are sort of benchmarks within those domains. Yeah. Like how good are you at, in particular, for one problem we worked on was uh, neuron morphology classification. And there were certain techniques that were well developed. And of course, what one does is to compare to some of those known techniques. And also that inspired us for doing precisely these sorts of ablation studies that you were saying, okay, we're taking into account, for example, if you're taking into account the fact that you have these bars which have uh, birth and death points, maybe you could just say, oh, well, instead we just take the collection of branches without remembering certain, in certain topological information about it, which is closer to what people were studying before, how does that change the results? So though it's really, <clears throat> excuse me, when you're working on a particular application, I think it's important to think about domain-specific benchmarks that are relevant to the practitioners. Thank you. So I think it's time to address one key important concept. I might call it the elephant in the room, since we are in Switzerland, maybe the cow in the room. <laughs> and that is that one that we also mentioned many times here of interpretability. So how can topology improve, say, interpretability of machine learning or deep learning? In which sense does it? Because people may argue it's already so mathematically difficult that maybe it's not an interpretable layer, it's another complex layer on top of what is already fully cannot be understood. So what, what is your point? And what, are, what is your argument on that? Well, I guess I would say that topology doesn't need to be difficult. I think that we're born with a natural sense of topology. We understand that we could go through a door, but we can't go through a wall. So I think that much of it comes down to the education and our confidence in ourselves and our ability to learn things. Um, so I really do believe that anyone can learn topology. Um, and back to the interpretability side of it, I think that that kind of comes to something kind of in between interpretability and benchmarks, which is null models and things to compare your uh, topological signatures to. So for instance, when we get um, a persistence diagram or a barcode, maybe we want to be able to say, this really is coming from like a Poisson process. Maybe this is coming from, you know, something that's spatially laid out on a sphere and try to relate that back to something that we already know. And I think that it's more in the development of these connections between topological signatures and null models that we could develop the interpretability further. So I, I want to note that I think there's actually many different senses of interpretability and uh, they often get completed uh, because it, it's just thrown around as the single word interpretability. But I think there's a lot of ways you can look at it and one of them is end user interpretability. And I think that's what you're talking about when you, you say that maybe the, the topology is, is too hard and I, I actually I think, I think it's not. I think we need to do a better job explaining it. But that's end user interpretability. That's not the be all and end all of interpretability. I think, uh, you know, when many people talk about deep neural networks not being interpretable, they don't necessarily mean end user interpretability. People have added, uh, you know, tools on top, like uh, SHAP and LIME and things like this, to be able to interpret, have an end user interpret what the, what the model is doing. What many people often mean is that they don't understand why a deep ne neural network actually works. It approximates some function somehow. How does it manage to not overfit? Well, you know, there's some speculation, but, and at the end of the day, a lot of these techniques come down to powerful things that use a lot of uh, heuristic techniques. Uh, it's sort of an engineering hill climb. People got better and better and better against their metrics that they benchmarked against, but we don't necessarily have a clear idea of why it works. And so I feel like that's the interpretability that uh, these topological techniques are more likely to provide is 
more understanding of why any of these techniques should work at all. Yes, and you have seen today uh, point clouds and persistence diagrams that might work also as point clouds. <laughs> so the interpreti interpretability question uh, uh, in this language would be to show where this resistance cycle, so holes, are present in our data in a point cloud. So back from persistence to a point cloud, the inverse problem in a sense. So I think it's difficult to answer the question because I think interpretability is not a very well-defined concept. And it may mean different things depending also on the context. So I don't know what we mean exactly by interpretability. For me, interpretability does not necessarily mean that people need to be able to read persistent diagrams and say, oh, OK, this is what's going on, etc. This is not per uh, interpretability. Interpretability is something which is quite fuzzy. But I think one thing we can say uh, in favor of TDA is that I think uh, just thinking of the specific case where we see TDA just as some kind of uh, feature of generating uh, process, one of the big advantages is that it comes with a very strong and deep mathematical uh, theory and guarantees. So as Catherine mentioned, you have some stability results that tell you that you know that if you change your data in this way, your features, the, the topological information you will get will change in this way or will not change too much or, or in general. This so it's like invariant in mathematics. They are used as discriminative things. So uh, at the opposite, if you see that your features change a lot, you know that something happened in your data. And uh, you, if it's a cycle that suddenly becomes very long or something like that, you can interpret it a little bit. But I think it's probably, uh, maybe it's very basic thing, but one big advantage of TDA is that, probably, uh, from my perspective, it's one of the rare uh, feature engineering uh, process that comes with really strong and deep mathematical understanding. And uh, I think this is a real strength. And, and, and to, add, to add to this, in some application domains, we can use the features that we generate from, from topology and, and project them back into the application domain. So one of the prime examples uh, would be, of course, graph classification, where you can say, OK, there are cycles in the graph, and they are important for the classification. But we can also go higher. We could probably look at, at, at neuroscientific applications, where we could say that a certain void is actually something that is that is there in the data at a certain point if we use, let's say, an, an fMRI um, image or if we use some, some kind of correlation graph that we analyze. And so it, it might not be that it, it's certainly possible, as, as Lyndon said, um, that in interpretability is like a, like a big umbrella term. And so for some applications, we can actually go to the users with our results and we can say, okay, this is what's happening. Is this interesting? Um, for other applications, we can't. But at least what we can do is we can we know what our feature maps are, are doing. We know what our feature maps are, are trying to learn. Um, and this also makes it possible to say whether it's, a, it's suitable for an application or not. It's a very principled way to proceed in general. And one thing that definitely appeals to me as a mathematician is the fact that you, yes, okay, at some stages you're making some choices of parameters and so on, but somehow you can limit the number of hyperparameters that you're mm -hmm. fixing in the process, that a lot of it is unsupervised, a lot of it is principled, and therefore I think on, on more solid footing than a lot of what goes on in terms of in-data analysis. Okay, so thank you all for these very interesting insights, and uh, the track is not over because Umberto has to go, so let's thank the speaker.